here at Columbia University, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this event, Europe's Moment of Truth, organized by the European Institute and co cooperation with the Maison Francaise. We are extremely honored to have with us first Vice President of the European Union Commission, Vice President Franz Timmermans, who will discuss with us the current challenges, challenges facing Europe today. Vice President Timmermans is particularly well placed to tell us about Europe, as I'm sure many of you know. He has been the right-hand man of Jean-Claude Juncker, the President of the European Commission, for almost a year now. And we've seen that it's been a particularly hectic year, so I, I don't envy him to work, but I thank him for it. Mr. Timmermans joined the Commission after a very distinguished diplomatic and political career, throughout which he was constantly involved in the life and destiny of Europe as a diplomat, as an advisor to the EU and the OSCE commissioners, as a member of the Dutch Parliament, as the Dutch Minister of European Affairs, and as the Dutch Foreign Minister. Mr. Vice President, thank you for being here with us today. We're quite honored by your presence, deeply so. Uh, we very much look forward to hearing your thoughts about the challenges facing Europe today at a time that you recently described as a moment of truth in European history, which brings us here. I'm also delighted to introduce my new colleague, our great steel from Yale, Professor Adam Tews, who is the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of History at Columbia and the new director of the European Institute, having um, succeeded Victoria de Grazia. Is Vicky here? Um, no. Uh, who is the Moore Collegiate Professor of History. Uh, he succeeded her this summer. Professor Tews will moderate the discussion and the question and answer session with the audience. You should know that this event is also a special occasion for Columbia as it marks the opening of a new series of conferences entitled Getting to Know Europe, um, a series uh, at the European Institute which receives generous support from the EU as well as other donors. The next event in this series is tomorrow evening and uh, will feature, among others, Nobel Prize laureate Orhan Pamuk in a discussion of the European dream. I will now give the floor over to Professor Tews, who will introduce the discussion. But before that, please join me in welcoming Vice President Timmermans. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lord. Um, it is a, an enormous pleasure to be here. And as you like to say, a signal honor for Columbia University to be hosting uh, first Vice President. Franz Timmermans here today. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. You will, uh, I'm sure, discover over the course of uh, our conversation that it's, it's not just an honor, it's, it's a real pleasure. Uh, uh, First Vice President Timmermans is extremely good value. Um, so we, we are going to have, we are going to have, uh, I, I have no doubt. Um, uh, we, we've already started an intense conversation over lunch and, I, and I'm certain that uh, the audience here is going to want to pepper you with uh, questions the current affairs variety, the range of issues facing Europe today uh, is, is, is bewildering. It's an extraordinary time to be at the helm uh, there. As you have said, in a, a sort of perhaps a gloomy or more alarmist moment, this may be the last chance commission. This is a commission which has really got to get things right. But before we go there, uh, before we open the floor uh, to questions, we, I should also say that we need to wrap things up with the last question around 2020, 20 past 25 past 2, because uh, First Vice President uh, Timmermans' schedule is, as you can imagine, intensely uh, busy, so you'll forgive me if I'm, I'm abrupt and severe about that line. But I think before we plunge into that, that discussion of the, of the present day, Allow me to indulge my, my tendency as a historian to go back a bit, not as a way of escaping the present, but as a way of getting back to the present but by a different route. And if we go back over your career after a childhood uh, brought up, forgive me saying, as a Euro brat on the move around Europe, time in Rome, uh, a multilingual education, which we will benefit, which we benefit from enormously. Um, after national service, you, you enter the, the Dutch uh, civil service as a foreign service officer and end up being posted quite quickly to Russia. And uh, my understanding is that you witnessed the fall of communism, the end of the Soviet Union, from the desk in the, in the Dutch foreign office. And I know this is something that has stayed with you, you referred to it several times. Can you tell us a little bit about how that shaped your, your early understanding of the politics of Europe? Well, you see, I, I've always maintained that the biggest challenge for my generation how we cope with the end of the European divide. Yes. I was brought up as um, I was trained as a soldier 
to be an interrogator, a lone Russian in the army, because we still believe that in those days, yes, young people, it's true, that we were going to war with, uh, potentially, with the Soviet Union. And I was trained to, to interrogate um, uh, Russian POW. We were going to take prisoners and then interview. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's completely nonsensical, of course. We'd be destroyed within a few minutes. But um, that was the attitude. That was my younger years. That was the age I had with most people. You, you have today. And to go from that to a situation where the wall comes down, where the European divide stops, that is, I was, I've always said, the most important event in my life. And I want, wanted to dedicate my professional life to manage the consequences of that, to make sure that we could handle it, that we could integrate Central and Eastern Europe into the European project, that we could offer what the people there wanted, freedom, openness, transparency, all the things that they had lacked during communist oppression. And I think, frankly, looking back now, with all the mistakes that were made and all the problems that arose, it is a spectacular, a spectacular success of historic proportions, and I believe we should be prouder of that, that we are as Europeans. But the last couple of years, I've started to wonder whether that was really the biggest challenge I would face in my, in my political career, because the challenges we see now, because of global developments, because of social restructuring going on in the Western world, that might be at least as daunting as the challenge we faced when we were and, and as you move from the civil service into politics by way of the, the, the Dutch uh, Labour Party, one of the kind of bastions of social democracy in the European post 45 period, you, you, the solution presumably is social democracy, welfare, and more Europe. And this is the way this is going to work. Yeah. And then all of us who were of this disposition faced this shattering shock in 2005 when two of the lead elephants of that, one larger, one smaller, but nevertheless, lead elephants of that original European project in 2005 and vote down the constitution that is in fact going to complete this perpetually unfinished business of building a political Europe. And in the interview, or rather candid interview with the FT, you described the, the shock this meant for your system and then you responded in a way charmingly that any Dutch politician apparently does, which is to get on your bike and ride around your constituency and take coffee with your constituents, which is a, a reaction one could only, one could only hope for. And out of this, you say, comes a new vision of Europe for you, with new premises, re-evaluating its, its ideas. Can you tell us a little bit more about that vision, which I think still informs your sense of what European politics ought to be about, this post-2005 conception? I think for me personally, the biggest change for me was that to, to challenge the premise that Europe needs to be constructed at the expense of the nation state, that we can only do the European thing by taking them away from the nation state. I think that premise was wrong. I think Europe can only be constructed with the nation states. The nation states need to be reinvigorated. Their sovereignty needs to be reinvented and recharged, as it were, through Europe. Um, and that is the vision I, I now have of European cooperation, which is widely challenged because many people argue that um, national sovereignty can only be restored by taking things away from Europe. And actually they're making exactly the same mistake as we used to make in thinking that you could only construct Europe at the expense of the nation state. They're now making the counter argument saying you can only save our countries at the expense of European uh, integration, which I think is just as wrong as uh, the uh, opposite assumption. This is why First Vice President Tillemans is widely regarded as the EU's secret weapon in the struggle over Brexit because uh, because uh, of this this uh, this distinctive take on on the on the on the situation that we're in. Well, so, you know, don't, don't don't turn me into sort of a chief inspector who's over. <laughs> <laughs> your your accent is far too far too natural for that. It's plausible. Um, the the on a on a far more serious note. Um, in, in 2012, you, you move into government and now in the rank of foreign minister and are facing then, as it were, the situation in Europe in the aftermath of the most acute phase of the Eurozone crisis. And then in 2013, the disaster of European foreign policy in the Ukraine, the derailment of Europe's negotiations with the Ukraine, um, 
and uh, the ensuing uh, revolution there and the escalation of violence there. And at that point, you're engaged in relatively normal diplomacy, meeting Kerry, making the Netherlands' contribution to the EU stance against Russia. But it must, in some sense, have seemed quite remote until that terrible day in July 2014 when the news comes through the wires of the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner, uh, which claimed 290 lives, of which 200 were, were almost 200 were Dutch. And it puts you in this extraordinary position of having uh, to articulate the, the, the uh, grief and anger that your country must have felt at that moment. Uh, an event in some ways comparable to 9-11 in its intensity for a country of the Absolutely. size of the Netherlands. It's a, it's a terrible shock. And you, you go to the Security Council, or invited to the Security Council along with the Australians to, to address the Security Council. And if you haven't seen the speech that First Vice President Timmermans made on that occasion, I really strongly urge you to do so, because it's an example, I think, of, of democratic rhetoric applied to a truly extraordinary humanist rhetoric. But tell us, how did that experience, because you expressed there a sense of grief and a demand for justice, and also profound frustration at the inability of the international community to get to grips with this problem, which had led to this murder, this mass assassination, in those horrible circumstances. How, how did that change your view of international affairs, and does that stay with you still as a, as a defining moment? Well, it changed my life, obviously, as it did of, of, of all the relatives and friends of the people who died uh, on that occasion. It has changed the Netherlands. Um, it has it is brought home the point that international politics, you know, is not far removed issue. It's something that can that can affect any nation, any community on any day. And it also convinced me of the need to reinforce international cooperation, to make sure the United Nations can act in these occasions, to not uh, see international instruments as, as outdated. Uh, we need them in the future. And <clears throat> I also think we as Europeans got it wrong with Russia for 20 years and some of us being completely obsessed uh, with Russia, others being terribly naive about Russia and we, because of that, because of different attitudes, we were never able to formulate a European policy towards uh, uh, Russia and, and we're still not really good at that, to put it mildly. Um, so all these things uh, uh, played a role there, but my most important point at the time in the Security Council was that I needed to get the Security Council to endorse our efforts to get access to the region, to make sure we could bring the victims home, to make sure we could investigate what had happened, and to make sure that we could lay the foundation for prosecution later on. And we needed the international community for that. That was my goal, going to the Security Council. And I had this profound need to tell these Mothers and fathers around the table, because they're not just people representing their countries, they're also mothers and fathers around the table. I found a need to explain to them what was going on in my country, how this was perceived by the nation, why the nation was grieving, what was happening. And I really wanted to make it very explicit. Um, and that's what I did. It is, as I said, um, something that you should see if you, you haven't had the chance to. It's credited, I think, for turning the Security Council and the EU towards a policy of war. Assertive sanctions, certainly in the German context, that is the defining moment, I think, in pushing uh, Merkel and the uh, uh, German business far from anything else out of its, uh, out of its position of um, atomtisme with regard to Putin. That same summer, uh, earlier, um, Europe is going through the, the routine of a European parliamentary election and the business of selecting a, a commission. And it goes about it in a new way, in the sense that the Parties in the European Parliament for the first time nominate uh, Spitzenkandidaten, for the first time nominate uh, lead candidates, and there's an understanding, tacit it turns out, not as explicit as it might have been, that the candidate who, whose party wins the European Parliament in HLH elections will be the first pick for president of the Commission, and it's Juncker who then uh, emerges. And it's Juncker in turn who uh, canvasses the governments, and uh, out of this process, uh, you emerged as the Dutch commissioner, and, and um, as Alondra was saying, was selected by Juncker as his, his right-hand man as this new position of the first.
first vice president. So the commission is now structured into commissioners, vice presidents, and uh, Herr Timmermans is the first vice president working directly for Juncker in a kind of CEO role almost in managing the, the business of the commission. In his letter to you, which is published online, which he describes his mission statement for you, one of the recurring refrains and one of the things that's also intriguing and puzzling is this demand that this be a political commission. But this is not a technocratic organisation, uh, but this is a political commission answerable to the parliament. And what I really want to ask is what that means. Uh, what does a political commission mean? It's made up of people from across the political spectrum. Uh, you didn't directly run for this office. So how do we imagine this? And does it, is it part of an ongoing transformation of the EU constitution or its self-understanding? First of all, um, I'm amazed at the level of preparation you put into this. Okay. So we, um, You're very interested. I've never, been in, I've never been interviewed by anyone who's so well prepared. But, um, I never believed in the, in the idea of Spitzen coming up. I thought it was a political game. I, I thought it wouldn't bring anything. I thought at the end of the day, the European Council would decide anyway. Right? Boy, was I wrong. I was wrong on this. Massively wrong. The fact that they chose to have Spitzen coming up gave Jean-Claude Juncker, a position that is more independent from yes. national governments and from the European Council than any of his predecessors before him. Um, so, political commission means a president of the commission who has the room to be more political than his predecessors because he can say no to big member states, um, with measure, of course, but still to a much larger degree than his predecessors because he got his mandate in accordance with the European Parliament and, of course, you know, the European Council endorsed it, um, but it wasn't their choice. And that has a huge political effect on the relationship between the institutions. Um, so the Commission is now, thanks to Jean-Claude Juncker, in a position to be more independent. And when he says it's the last chance commission, it is a commission that is more independent and therefore tries to be the commission as intended in the treaty, which is to be uh, not a secretary general of the European Council, neither a slave to the European Parliament. So we need to ascertain our own position and need to say no sometimes. And, and saying no to the European Parliament, and the European Parliament said, like, hang on, the commission said no, we're not used to that anymore. So both the European Council and the European Parliament have to get used to this new role of the Commission, and frankly the Commission itself has to get used to that role. And I see it as my duty to, to sort of help Commission structures get used to that role. Because you know, the Commission is traditionally, and has become over the years more and more, a, a huge collection of silos. Um, silos that shall never meet um, and do their business within the silo. And with a new structure with Vice Presidents and you know, we're breaking down the cycle. Uh, and that is creating much more political momentum at a much earlier stage. We discuss policy across different policy areas at a much earlier stage than uh, used to be done uh, before. And that creates more political momentum as well. This is the famous meeting where you take 80 proposals and hack it down to 23. Or something like that. It's a star chamber. So, to move on to policy, um, reading your speeches, uh, one struck by a, re a recurring refrain, and I think it's a very fascinating one for anyone interested in democracy, democratic politics, and the rhetoric of democratic leadership. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating refrain, and this issue of self-confidence. You've, you've repeatedly said that you think the fundamental threat to Europe, or the fundamental obstacle that it needs to overcome, is a lack of self-confidence, and the endemic suspicion, the mutual suspicion between European states. I mean, that's a, that's a on the one hand, an incredibly resonant phrase, and it's a phrase with a history of democratic rhetoric. I always think of Roosevelt, and we have nothing to fear but fear itself, right? That democracy needs to mobilize itself for action. Uh, but it's also potentially kind of empty. It's a phrase which could mean nothing at all other than a kind of positive thinking, kind of sunniness. Uh, unfamiliar with much of Europe, but nevertheless, it could just be that. So, so what for you, what is the, the guts of, of a more self confident well, you know, to paraphrase Mark Twain, you know, the, the uh, announcement about the mice is a bit premature. Um, uh, Europe has a lot to offer to the world. Uh, we have 
um, I think um, the highest educated population uh, across the board from many parts of the world. We have the strongest and best social systems of the world. Uh, we have the healthiest, uh, best educated uh, youngest generation of the world. Uh, we have many things going for us, but we don't see it like that. We think, you know, we, we're, we're in a sort of end of days mood, uh, which I, I think is totally unjustified. Um, I'm not going to change that by speeches. Even if I make great speeches, that will not change. So we need the evidence out there uh, at a time when people don't want to be bothered by, by evidence. Um, and I, I think this is one of the challenges. I, I was talking to, to uh, I, I, I refer to them as NGOs, but there's a different acronym, CSOs last night, um, civil society organizations. And they were asking us to do all sorts of things um, and build a constituency. And I was saying to them, which it didn't refute, we have the same problem. Our constituencies are very narrow. You know, you know, the big CSOs have narrow constituencies if you look across the population. And where we are taking down silos in the Commission, I see in European society silos emerging all over the place in society. I can take a very personal example. My oldest daughter, she's 28, she is a pharmacist assistant. My oldest son, he's 26, he's a lawyer. They live in different worlds, literally in different worlds. They worry about different things. My son worries about global uh, problems. My daughter worries about whether she can pay the rent by the end of the month. And this is the same generation, two people who love each other dearly, who would do anything for each other, but sometimes don't under understand each other's world. And this is happening in young generations all across the Western world, especially in Europe. Don't, they don't share, you know, you, you get together at the global system. We're all on the same line, but there's there's at least as many people out there who don't understand that commitment to the rest of the world because they have different worries. And that's where my, where I believe uh, where social democracy, if I can make it political, is dying. It's because we're no longer building bridges. We're returning to a situation where politics will be formulated as politics serving one specific interest. And that, how you do that in a complex democratic society, I don't see it. I don't see it working. So we need to get together with people in social uh, networks, with people in, in, in civil society, to make sure that we start developing the concept of building bridges between people with different interests and creating coalitions based on shared interests. Where is a shared interest in our society? Where is it? Can we formulate it across social boundaries, across ethnic boundaries, across um, uh, uh, age boundaries, can we formulate something that we have in common? That is where the future lies in democratic politics, and I'm not sure we're well equipped to get where we need to be. I'm going to ask one more question and then open the floor up. And it follows, in a sense, it's a kind of echo of what you just said, but it is a puzzle to me, a frustration, we already started talking about it over lunch. Which is that for a politician who espouses this language of self-confidence and optimism, and the search for the creation of meaningful community. On the, the one issue that I would have thought would be the dearest to the heart of a European social democrat, the problem of unemployment. What President Juncker has referred to hauntingly as the 29th nation of the European Union, the 29th nation of the unemployed, and that's a young nation of young people whose lives are being ruined by largely the after effects of the economic crisis which they lived through which they were largely not responsible for, too young to be responsible for the debts that were accumulated. But in the face of this, the, the response by the European nation states and indeed the Commission is so anemic. The level of the ECB, we now have something like QE4. The level of structural reform, there's endless good intentions and lots of talks about improving the European labour market. But the single missing ingredient that Americans take for granted, namely a powerful fiscal response in space, evident demand failure, which is clearly the state of the Eurozone right now. The response to that is this 300 billion euro investment program from the Commission, which turns out basically to be a kind of leverage private finance scheme, um, which may or may not displace private activity, and as you were saying at lunch, depends on the initiative of private entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs to come forward, which in a situation of depression and lacking self-confidence, it's not there. It's famously pushing on a piece of string. The dog is dead. It won't run. The initiative has to come from the public side. And that, to me, is really the fundamental question that I have for the Juncker Commission. How is it that you are going to address the unemployment problem, and where is the confidence and initiative going to come from? 
you take leading questions to a whole different dynamic. <laughs> um, uh, but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Youth unemployment is, well, my generation is an example. We lost part of my generation in the early 1980s because of exactly the same problem. So much talent was lost in Europe in those years because people leaving university didn't get a job. And they never caught on again. And we run that risk in a terrible way now, which is mind-boggling if you look at the data on a larger scale. Industry in many member states is facing the issue of not having enough people to do the jobs. And at the same time, we have a lot of unemployment. The problem is not that there's not no jobs and people are unemployed. The problem is that people who are unemployed are not able to fill the jobs that are out there. That's the fundamental problem we face. And it's a problem of education. And at the end of the day, I'm not saying the Commission can solve all this because we have no competence. I know we have to be very clear. The Commission cannot do things that are beyond our competence. At the end of the day, if we don't break out of the mold that government is bad, societies can run themselves, people should pay for their own education. If we don't challenge that premise, which has been sort of the premise of the last 20 years of how governments were run in, in, in Western societies, if we don't challenge that, if we don't bring more public funds to education, if we don't create a system of lifelong learning, if we don't create a sort of a circular economy of learning, that people go into jobs and then come to back to education, go to jobs, if we don't do that in the Western world, we will not create a certain economy, we will not be socially sustainable, we will lose at least one generation, and we will lose global competition for the future of the world. So I think, I think you, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, we're, not, we're not doing the right things now. I'm not sure that your premise that we should be investing more in this or that is the only answer to this. I think the lack of confidence in the capability of government to organize these things is what's ailing us. The lack of confidence that education can deliver is ailing us. Uh, challenging the fact uh, that education is a, a, a global public good, is a national public good. Challenging the fact that it's in the interest of a whole society to put money into education and this should be done only by the ones who profit from education. I mean, this is the sort of thing, the sort of debate we should be having. And this is where I see the future of social democracy. If it has a future, it's in that area. Back. Yes. Uh, yes. And to what extent are the problems of Europe um, something that comes implicitly from the legacy of the political cultural centralism of the nation state? And the greater issue is to what extent are the problems of Europe, many, many nations above the 29 states that are involved, or that's exact number, uh, come from using implicitly the United States federal part, uh, aid. Structure as a model for the European Union. And for instance, it's been said that in the Euro, and the, the, the Euro's fiscal policy has been patterned after the needs of Germany, perhaps France, and the European, European needs in, in Brussels, but it really hasn't been, been uh, governed, uh, managed in response to the, to, the, to the economic needs of the other member states. Um, so people have argued, for instance, in the case of Greece, the, 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 the usefulness of returning to the drug market the way of addressing their lack of synchronization. More importantly, you had incidents like the, the, the vote yesterday in Catalonia for independence, and just one of many regions, perhaps one that, that, that stands out because they have a memory of their own sovereignty. How does that suggest a well, when solution? Exactly, in this tree was Catalonia sovereign nation. And they were sovereign nation on the front of Paraguay, they were the executive the, the capital on the front of Paraguay. Okay, well, let's not get into it. The story of Catalan's very important memory and yes. it's a lot of them, which is the case of the country. And, and it, it's, it's a problem because, of course, the Catalans are in threat to be thrown out of the European Union, thrown out of Europe, and it's still border independence. But what it speaks is to a deeper need for radical decentralization of the European project as something that is natural with Europe as a multicultural, multi region. Hey, so um, now, that's your good question. The, 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 um, I, I'll try and answer your question, uh, if I understood it correctly. Uh, the issue is that 
But since borders between nation states in Europe are no longer a source of threats, the necessity for nation states to repress diversity within their borders has largely diminished. So nation states, because of European integration, have become extremely relaxed about cultural differences within their borders. Um, the Dutch language was suppressed for generations in the north of France because France saw it as a threat to its territorial integrity. Now, the Dutch language is flourishing and there's a lot of Dutch language taught in the north of France. People think that is very interesting. Same happened with German in the east of France. Same happens with regional languages in many, many nations. And so I would see the pro process of regionalization as uh, a product of European integration. It's not a contradiction with European integration because you know, through uh, the creation of nation states was done at the expense of diversity within the borders of those nation states in a tremendous way. France is a case in point. You know, millions of people died in so-called religious wars, which were not always religious wars. Religion was an instrument to create national unity. And this happened all across Europe. And the beauty of European integration is to take that problem away it leads to a new problem, which is um, uh, the uh, striving for independence of regions. You see it in Belgium, you see it in, in the United Kingdom, you see it in, in Spain. And interestingly enough, all these subnational entities, regional entities, have one desire in common to be a full-fledged member of a European project. They are extremely federalist because they believe the European Union is the answer for them to uh, what they perceive as an oppressive nation state. So I hope that's, that's uh, no, that's not an answer to your question. I see it in your body language. Uh, I'm afraid that will have to do. I'm going to put political science. Uh, Hi, I'm Patricia Excel. I teach political science here. Um, uh, so I'm going to follow Professor Chu's example by asking another leading question. Yes, go uh, ahead. If the commission is it's a university. That's where you get leading questions. <laughs> if the commission is transitioning from a technocratic paradigm to a political one, there's certainly no shortage of political issues for it to wade into. Um, and one of those is uh, uh, regarding member states' ability or willingness to uphold the standards of constitutional democracy. Yes. I'm wondering how much latitude you see the commission as having in addressing situations uh, where member states endanger the European Union's commitment to Article 2 values, to democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, and so on. Mm -hmm. I won't name names. No. <laughs> There's no need. There's <laughs> uh, no need. Um, but Hungary is by no means the only country affected by this. Let's be very clear about this. It's easy to pick on one country, but it's a wider problem that affects almost all member states. Um, but the answer is not in political rhetoric. The biggest failure you can do um, populist politicians is to answer their populism with your populism. It only increases the support they can create for their own position. So we have legal instruments to be very precise, to analyze um, laws and propositions, to give our comments. And to stick to the example of Hungary, so far, if we really get into the heart of the matter and are very precise on the legal instruments, um, we can correct it, but every time they will give in to our criticism. Every time until now, once we say, no, here you really cross the line, you should be doing this, they come back. Having said that, there's one thing we cannot really do anything about if member states are not willing to address that amongst themselves. Now that is the political climate that is created by always going to the extreme of what is allowed in a certain political context, in a context of rhetoric, in a context of creating this image of a self-destructive West that is willing to give up its own culture by importing endless amounts of Muslims and, and, and colored people, etc., etc. That rhetoric is poisonous, but the Commission cannot counter that rhetoric with the instruments at our, proposal, at our disposal if that rhetoric is not met 
by an answer of all member states involved. The tendency of member states after the failure of addressing the situation in Austria with Haider, uh, when it was tried to sort of isolate Austria for entering uh, into for creating a coalition between the Christian Democrats and the FPÖ uh, at, at, at the time, there was a very strong reaction by some political leaders in, uh, in France uh, and Germany. It completely backfired because they didn't know how to sustain that effort. Since then, countries have become extremely reluctant to take up the issue, and they hope the Commission will, so they don't have to. But that's that's not possible. The Commission, we can do. We are the enforcer of European rules, and we should take that role more seriously than we've done in the past. Now we'll make sure we do. But it's going to be very precise. Entering into a, a, a battle of rhetorics with people like Mr. Orban is always going to strengthen this position. He can only be tackled in terms of political rhetoric by his peers in the European Council. That's where it happens, and that's where he's more subdued, actually, and we saw it last week. So, um, Europe this year has seen itself confronted with a rapidly, uh, a quickly escalating series of crises, uh, which seem to arrive almost more quickly than we have the means to solve them. And my question is, as a now more political commission, how can you stay ahead of the curve in identifying key issues and not run after the media cycle, uh, which forces national governments to pay attention to these sorts of issues, um, especially when, as you said, there's a whole range of challenges and this self-confidence boosting is very important. Um, what sort of leverage do you think you have over national governments and compared to your previous roles for Minister, do you see yourself as now having more power to flag up issues before they arrive? Well, let's take um, just one example, the refugee crisis we're now facing. All the proposals that were agreed are commission proposals. All the proposals challenged are also commission proposals, but we, you know, we took a huge risk. We didn't go to member states first and ask, oh, is that okay with you? No, we took the step. The distribution key was something member states, some member states uh, dislike, but we made an analysis of how we could solve this issue of one member state saying, you know, you take care of your own problems, I go to look away, this has been doing, going on for years. How do we get out of that situation? We thought about it long and hard, and the only concrete uh, uh, response to that would be show solidarity and the only way of doing that is in crisis situations have a distribution key so that people you know bear the brunt together that the solidarity never done before we did it and we got away with it because people understand you know my reaction always when it was criticized give me an alternative that's better and I'll defend it nobody came with an alternative so it's the quality of the people we have in our organization, which is really outstanding, really outstanding. If you ever, I say to the students here, if you ever really want to work in an organization with AAA uh, civil servants, come and work in the commission. They're really very good. Quality of our proposals, um, the diplomacy that we apply in talking to member states about this, the balance we see between the different interests, because the ones had an interest in not being left with all the refugees only in their country, the others had an interest in making sure that the countries where people arrive and apply the rules, which they hadn't been doing for a long time, and create a balance in those <coughs> proposals to achieve both goals, and it might work. So now, we're now in a better position on that than we were before. But make no mistake, this problem will not go away. It will be a long-term issue for Europe. And Europe to understand that it is no longer um, a continent of origin, but it's becoming a continent of destination. Uh, like the United States and others. That psychological change is perhaps the, most, the biggest challenge we face, and certainly in Central and Eastern European countries who, during Soviet occupation, were taught that everybody from the outside is a direct threat to national identity and national sovereignty. One here. Yes. Yes. Um, Dixie Reinhardt, uh, 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 um, I have sent you both a brief email last week about the refugee crisis. And now that a decision uh, is either being formulated or has been taken to distribute refugees, comes the 
big issue, which is how to employ, how yes. and integrate people, whether on a temporary basis or a permanent basis. And I had proposed um, training military age men, who I think I think the refugees are perhaps the most um, what's the word, motivated people uh, who are looking to solve the problem in the Middle East because it's their own countries that are involved. So I think by, by training them, adding them to military troops, and fighting together over there is perhaps the best job program. Because you don't have enough jobs for Europeans. What are you going to do with a million more people who have language skills, difficulties, etc.? Well, first of all, um, uh, thank you for your email, which was which was really uh, thought thought provoking, and, and you put a lot of effort into it. And thank you for that. Um, I honestly believe that there is no military solution for the war in, in Syria. Um, I honestly believe that putting troops in that theatre will exacerbate the problems. Will not will not solve them. I honestly believe we need. Negotiations involving all parties. Uh, we need negotiations quickly. Uh, we need to get everybody involved because it is also a proxy war, as you know, in the conflict uh, around uh, around the table. That's what needs to be done urgently. Having said that, I also believe, and I met some of the refugees, uh, Syrian refugees in the island of Kos, that we should be doing much, much more to help parents provide for their children where they are now in refugee camps in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Turkey, where well, most of them don't even live in refugee camps, but they're not allowed to work. So you meet people in Kos, I said, why are you here with three children? You're crazy, they might have drowned. And he said, hey, I ran out of all my savings. I don't want my children to starve in Turkey. I need to find a job so I can feed them. So let's try and create jobs for them in Turkey. Let's try and create possibilities. Let's, that's why you know, we've pledged 500 billion. I hope we can get that up to, to 1 billion to make sure that in the region we create schools, we create this housing, we create possibilities for jobs. Then you can sustainably have 3 million people with 1 billion euro. 3 million people will have a sustainable future in that area and they will be much easier to um, replace back to Syria once the conflict is ended because what's happening now is the most horrible brain drain in human history because everybody who was part of what was a middle income nation has fled that nation right now. So, so we have, we are all self-interest, we don't want, we can't have all these people in Europe. We simply can't. If we would open the doors for all refugees, not just talking about migrants, all refugees, social systems in Europe would explode. And the extreme right would come to power in every single nation, yes. including Germany. So that's the thing we need to avoid. And so we have to be honest and say we cannot take all these refugees, but we can do much more, and it's much cheaper, even if it costs billions, to create decent living standards for them in the surrounding areas. And having said that, we also have to be very clear. The countries in the region have done a tremendous effort. Lebanon now has a quarter of its population increased with refugees in quality. Can you imagine that? How many people that would be in another nation? Turkey is, is spending at least 6 billion uh, euros a year on, on the refugees. Um, Jordan's doing a tremendous job. I mean, I'm not saying these countries should be doing more. I'm saying Europe should be doing more, but not by inviting people all to come to Europe. That would not serve them, and it would certainly create a huge, huge problem in Europe. Question here from Professor Manfred, and I'm going to take all the bears back to back. A very quick question. Going back to your, uh, I think, very good description, you have now a more political commission, and Matopoulos was already asking, how can you express them? And you said, well, by projects and so on. We don't just criticize and, and talk about how we make real things. My question would be, how do you communicate and build the bridge of this idea of a political commission and really doing good things to the public of the That's okay, just because I can see your staff in front of you. Here we go. This one here. Yeah. I'm Dutch and I'm uh, a big fan of the EU and of me personally. Um, I'm proud of everything we achieved with the EU and I think there's a huge potential. 
but I feel embarrassed and um, disappointed by the way the EU is dealing with some main issues at this time. And it's, sometimes it looks like there's no long-term strategy for issues, and I'm just naming a few like Ukraine, refugees, Libya, um, shared EU energy policy, and I think there are a couple more. Um, what is your perspective on that? And does it have, are these issues too complex? Don't you have the resources? Or is it the media issue, communication issue? And just don't we see the strategy? Yeah. Um, they're essentially the same question. Um, first of all, be frank about the complexity of the problems. People accept your frankness. People are increasingly fed up with simplistic solutions. But we're in a situation where my complex answer, if it is not believed or it doesn't have any perspective, and the simplistic solution, many people say, okay, the complex answer is not working. Who knows, a simplistic one might. Let's follow that politician. That's the situation we're in in Europe. That's why the extreme right is on the rise in Europe in many nations. So all the issues you mentioned, energy, refugees, unemployment. The problem is a lack of perspective. What is the point we're heading to? And how do you communicate that by not treating people like simpletons? The, the temptation in politics for too long now has been to make things not just uncomplicated in language, but simple in content. And that is wrong. Your language has to be uncomplicated. But if you try and convince people that there are simple solutions to complex problems, you're in the middle of the minefield of populism and you need to get out there very quickly if you really want people to support you in the long, in the long run. People will accept the problems of refugees today, they will make way for them, they will create places for them in Europe, unless they have the idea, as many have today, that we have no clue how to solve this and it's only going to get worse. Once we can create a credible perspective of how we can get come to terms with the issue, how we can provide some of the solutions, people will accept the point that it's going to be a tough couple of years before we get out of the problems. But if people have the idea that we're, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're um, talking about fire prevention and at the same time our house is burning down, they're not going to follow you, they're not going to trust you, and that's the situation we're in on many issues in Europe now. And please accept my point that the traditional Commission reaction to this is, okay, um, let's explain it again. <laughs> it's not going to work. You know, I, I, the comparison I make is, you know the phenomenon. You speak to someone who doesn't speak your language, and you're trying to make a point. And what you do when you see that people doesn't understand the person doesn't understand you. The first reaction is to speak louder. <laughs> it doesn't make a difference. If people don't, if you're not on the same page, if people don't understand where you're coming from, if you're in a different dimension, you can scream as much as you like. People will not understand you, and certainly will not trust you. We are, we are in. The, why is 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 anti-systemic politics on the rise everywhere? Because people don't trust government anymore. People don't trust politicians. People don't trust system to deliver the results. We've seen periods of anti-systemic politics before, but always with an alternative system in the proposition. This is the first time in my living memory that we're now in anti-systemics without a proposition of an alternative that goes beyond, I'll take you to the past, which was so glorious, um, which, which, is, which is sort of the, the typical populist uh, reaction of someone who doesn't have a clue. We have time for two more, and I'm going to bundle Sveta and the gentleman in yellow. So I wanted to ask you about another crisis the EU is facing that we haven't had a chance to talk about, which is Brexit. Since you've conditioned your response to some of the other questions on the Commission's role in perspective in this particular issue, I wanted to ask how do you see the Commission's role and perhaps approach to Brexit? Okay, and then in yellow. Thank you. Um, so you touched before on the benefits and virtues of removing borders within Europe. You've also uh, mentioned the importance of solidarity and distribution of the migrants within uh, Europe itself. How do you actually enforce the distribution mechanism within Europe while still maintaining that borders for free movement? Okay. That's it. Uh, Brexit. Um, 
The commission is there to help. Um, almost sound like you know the, the scariest words in the English language by radio. Be careful here. Um, uh, we're we're waiting for the British government to be very precise on what they want out of the process, and then we're there to try and accommodate uh, what the British government want. Many of the things they want, I want. Uh, the commission wants. Uh, we want Europe to you know, concentrate on the main issues. We want uh, less red tape for small and medium-sized enterprises. We want to make sure that the internal market functions better. We want a capital markets union. We want um, an energy union. The United Kingdom wants all of that. So we can work on that, but then of course there are changes they want in the treaty. We'll listen to them, we'll try and advise them to do that, and we'll try and find a common solution. But at the end of the day, uh, David Cameron will have to make up his mind whether what he can negotiate in Brussels with his colleagues and with us is something he wants to take to the British voter with a, a, um, a clear a position that uh, the UK should stay in the European Union. But it's up to the British people. It's been made into a referendum. So now it's up to the British people to decide. And we will abide by the result. And we will try and advise uh, where we can um, from the position, from my personal position, that I believe it's absolutely in the EU's interest to keep the UK on board. I'm even so arrogant to say that it's later the case interest to stay in uh, uh, the EU, but hey, they will have to they will have to decide for themselves. And the one question I would ask anyone, and I asked Farage and others, are you quite sure, are you quite sure that by leaving the EU you'll be better off than by staying in? Are you confident enough to take that proposition to your voters in good conscience? Can you really make a good assessment of the consequences of Brexit. That's my only question, and I think it's a fair question. On the other issue, um, well, frankly, that's not a new problem. Um, already now, the asylum system works in such a way that people who get asylum in one member state get the right to reside in that member state, don't get the right to reside in other member states. They have the right to travel to other member states, but they can't reside in other member states and they can't take a job in other member states. So that will be exactly the same situation with the distribution key. You get the right to reside for five years in a specific uh, member state. And now this is done because you arrive in that member state or you register in that member state. Then it will be done because you will be distributed to that member state. But the principle is exactly the same. You get the right to reside and work in one member state. That right does not give you the right to do the same thing in another member state. But you can travel to the other member state. Because you've been fingerprinted upon arrival, the other member state can check whether you have the right to reside in that member state. So I think that's the way it's going to work. That people will then perhaps disappear in illegal structures. Hey, that's of all times. And I'm quite confident that you know very well that this nation has a, an issue with that as well. What remains for me to say really is to ask everyone here to join me in thanking you for a really fascinating conversation. Thank you for having me. saying, and I say it also as a former professor at, at Utrecht University, I can't be without saying that universities need to be more aware of their responsibility towards the communities they serve. Universities need to be more involved, even in the United States, where you're much better at this than we are in Europe, in rethinking the way our societies are structured, being part of that process, being more actively involved with practitioners of politics at local, regional, national level. There is a lack of dynamic, there is a lack of cross fertilization here that needs to be addressed very quickly because you guys are going to shape the future and you either do it well, either do it badly, but you will be doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you.